Olá, sejam todos muito bem-vindos. Hello. Hello, be all very welcome. My name is Mariana Oliveira, and today I will be the moderator of our webinar, Strengthening Entrepreneurship in the Restoration of the Atlantic Forests, promoted by WRI Brazil and the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact. This event will be recorded and will be made available at the WRI Brazil YouTube. This event will be in Portuguese, but we do have simultaneous interpretation into English. All of the Zoom platform resources are available to you. We have the chat in which you can interact with other participants. And we also have the Q&A button on which you can submit your questions to our panelists. On the backstage, the WRI Brazil team will be paying close attention to answer all of your doubt doubts. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for being with us. And I also thank you who is watching this recording at a later moment. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for being here with us today, all of the WRI Brazil, the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact, and the WRI Washington colleagues. Thank you all so much for organizing this webinar. Our event will be divided in two parts. First, we'll have a panel with the participation of our panelists. In this panel, we'll be talking about entrepreneurship in the restoration of the Atlantic Forest. On the second part, we will introduce to you the details of our Forestry Business Accelerator. I invite you all to submit your questions so we can further enrich our chat and enjoy this time together. Now, why holding such an event today? As many of us know, the native forests and native vegetation are a source of life in Brazil and in the world. They help us with um, food security, hydro security, and they can help us with the greenhouse effect gases. But we know that deforestation and non-sustainable economic activities are harmful to all of these benefits. That's when the restoration steps in. Restoration of landscapes and forests is one of the ways to revert all of that and to assure the maintenance of these ecosystems. So WRI Brazil, together with partners, is working to foment sustainable models of land use that may lead to shared benefits, employment, and income in the lands. That's why we launched last year the first public notice to participate in our forestry business for the Atlantic Forest Accelerator. We've been acting in the Latin America as a whole, Africa and Southern Asia. 46 countries have been part of these processes to improve their businesses. And now our network is growing and it will be acting in Brazil, more specifically in the Atlantic Forest. So to support our work, we believe it is possible to nurture a environment that can foster the scale and restoration, can strengthen all of the links, all of the chains, and also a short product to the market, increasing the financing in restoration chain. To talk, to tell us more about restoration, forestry business, and all of the actions that we need to gain scale, I would like to now open our panel. Let me start by inviting Fabiola Zerbini. She is currently the Director for Forests land use and agriculture of WRI Brazil. I also would like to invite Mr. Fernando Antunes Lopez, Government Affairs Manager for Salesforce Brazil. Salesforce is a supporter of our accelerator in Brazil. He will be telling more about it. Also, I would like to invite 
Ms. Elena Carascosa, Technical Coordinator of the Rifloresta SV program for the Secretary of Environment, Infrastructure and Logistics for the state of Sao Paulo, and Ludmila Pugliese, National Coordinator of the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact, our biggest partner at the accelerator. So I introduced the event and all of the drivers for us to be holding this event today. I'll be also responsible for moderating this panel in which we'll be talking about opportunities for the Atlantic Forest, all of the challenges and the importance of having a chain a restoration chain-based economy also focused on planning, implementation, and monitoring functions. Welcome, Fabiola. Thank you for your participation. I'd like to ask you to please share a little bit about the WRI Brazil's strategy in the forestry, land use, and agriculture program, and how the organization sees the strengthening of the entrepreneurship in the restoration chain as a contribution to achieve national and global goals to fight climate change and to implement public policies. Thank you, Mari. Thanks, everyone. Well, first, I feel with two hats today as a panelist and also as a host. So putting my panelist hat, a lot of your intro, Mary, brings important elements. So maybe I will underscore some elements that you have already shared. So how do we see today there's a strategic plan for 26, 27, so five years ahead of us? And how do we connect that to what we have embedded in our territory? Then we talk about the Atlantic forest, and the accelerator per se. So I'll try to build that bridge. First, the economy based on a standing forest as a project for the country's economic develop, this is our main axis, our sustaining pillar. And then how can we use the forest as in this pact towards which we've always been focused. So of course, climate security, water security, empowering the local population. So different people can strengthen themselves as actors. So we want to do all of that in order to get to this positive impact. We, we need that. It's more than wanting it. We need that for in order to humankind in order for humankind to survive, basically. So we have three elements. This standing forest economy, it is a systemic project. So it should be made long term and it needs to be connected to the land, the land's potentialities, the land's background, biophysical traits, and also social economical traits. First aspect is to have this land point of view. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the Atlantic forest? What are, what are the gaps? What are the surrounding actors, the political actors, the story, right? Mariana, so much has been done already. That kind of point of view is fundamental in order for us to think about an economic reasoning. So we are not we are basing our development project with this forest in the core, and we cannot do that without engaging all of the stakeholders. So we work strongly, not only in mapping and understanding these characteristics, but also in translating all of, all of that in action plans, in these pacts. So once we have thought about this economy as an agenda, then it was a shift in our mentality. And I think that's fundamental. Forestry economy is not a cost. It is an investment. We did a 
pilot for the para state so three million hectares should be restored there which would increase the gdp of the state in over to over seven million dollars per year because the restoration chain will generate employment so it is not a cost of course it does have it is fundamental environmental role ecosystem services climate water and etc but also it can be a driver for that region's economic development from the seeds services infrastructure logistics everything that it entails so it is a change on the mindset to a new economic model so we've been working a lot with a uh, salary pricing but also how can we optimize the investments for this agenda so it is the impact and also the economic benefits and then of course the atlantic forest the atlantic forest brings together advanced states from the political and economic point of view also different actors because governance is really solid those that work with other biomes when we come to the atlantic forest we can see that it is very very strong the governance all of our colleagues the partners so the pact in itself right the atlantic forest restoration pact so it is an environment for us to try this logic of a standing forest west restoration as the engine right and i think uh fernando will tell us that salesforce sees the atlantic forest as a global flagship the accelerator will be a kickstart to strengthen the businesses but all of the connection between the public policies the private investment governance that we have beyond the government governance in these forums and alliances and everything as we are here represented by the pact so we have good chances of in the next five years making it happen at the atlantic forest proving that such economy can work based on restoration so i want to listen from the partners because it is in uh, the joining of all of these forces that we will be able to get there it's not only a wri plan it is a contribution amongst many ecosystems so we are here to work together thank you thank you fabula i think you brought a nice context of what we are thinking as an organization when you mention these numbers um, and i see helena's face we've been working in the restoration opportunities mapping a while ago for the paraiba valley in the state of sao paulo should it be restored it would impact the gdp of the region could increase up to 32 percent so i believe that yes restoration is part of the agroforestry economy also we need to think about the economic valuation of the restoration with native species the specific project that was already looking at the restoration projects the existing ones and now we have the accelerator the accelerator is thinking about the smbs so we are bringing this new point of view and now i would like to invite fernando fernando many of the people who are with us today relate to this um, topic of restoring landscapes and forests this is not a new topic to Salesforce, right? So can you tell us a little about this connection of Salesforce with this topic? And also, can you share the perspectives, how your perspective on how the private sector is um, has been acting more broadly in restoration and how encouraging business support systems can contribute to the restoration agenda? 
Thank you, Mariana. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you all for this invitation. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and to be supporting WRI in Brazil and in the world. Also, we would like to convey our message in the hopes that that can impact other companies. First and foremost, just to put everybody on the same page, Salesforce is a CRM software company. It was born to connect companies with its customers, suppliers, government, with citizens, NGOs, with its um, public, its target population and sponsors as well. So it's all about connecting communities since 99 we have been uh, working on giving back to the community to the planet so to sustainability and the environment one of our key values talking specifically about restoration we are proud of being a net zero emission company and we have been that for a few years now, we are proud of that. I can tell you about that and how we can support other companies, governments and NGOs to, to get there as well. Um, but so as a company that is net zero emissions, we have many initiatives. First, we would like to launch big public private partnerships. We were part of the Lift Coalition 2021 on the Lands Day together with the United States, Norwegian government and in the, the British government as well, together with many companies. Also at the World Economic Forum, we were part of the One Trillion Threes project. So we want this project aims to plant One Trillion Trees up to 2030 that was in 2019, and then in-house, what do we do? Well, we have different types of financing models. In innovation, we have Salesforce Venture Impact Fund for innovative actions. $175 million are invested. We have the sustainability bond up to $1 billion, billion but that's a whole other story. So we are talking about carbon offsetting. We are talking about directly investing in innovative actions. And then the third pillar would be the philanthropic one. We believe that it is very important due to the impact that it can bring us. So we do have a fund. It is our climate justice restoration fund we believe other companies can adopt such measures to better mitigate the biggest environment disasters why and i promise i will get there i'll get to your question but in theory philanthropy is a type of investment that is more risk tolerant so once we are able to prove that we can adopt such more tolerant measures from the monetary risk point of view, then we open the door for others to join you. Also, we have a local capillarity in local investors as well that are more directed to local actions. And perhaps other types of investments won't have that. And um, then I also would like to tell you that philanthropy corresponds to only 2%, only 2% of philanthropy goes towards climate mitigation. So that's an alert because we may be more balanced towards ESG. So maybe not only thinking about uh, the social policies, but also thinking about the environment, because we can support local population, local communities and solutions that can lead to sustainable development. So thinking about the three letters of the ESG 
acronym. Now, focusing in our accelerator and the WRI in particular, why do we support it? And why the Land Accelerator, which is like the umbrella program, the worldwide program, why supporting all of that? Well, it is bridging a gap between two words that don't communicate, the environment, entrepreneurs, and the investors. They do not speak the same language at times. So sometimes they are not on the same page. This program, the Accelerator program is very beautiful because it trains everybody in order to better communicate and be able to access more competitive sources. Then Fabiola said, talked about the Atlantic Forest and she said I would have something to say about it. Well, yes, the Atlantic Forest is a biome that um, has impactful actions that stand up, as Fabiola said, and consonant to what's being said at the Conference of Parts 15. Fabiola was there, we were there. The Atlantic Forest was one of the 11 flagships for the UN with great world impact. We are so happy to support it because it's not only about Brazil, it extends to Argentina, Paraguay, where we have customers and we support other NGOs. So indeed it is a big worldwide impact and it is a um, showcasing as well, right, for Brazil. It is so beautiful to talk about the Atlantic Forest to our global executives. In Brazil, when people think about Brazil, they think about the Amazon and they don't know about the how rich our ecosystem is at the Atlantic Forest. It's more mature. So we believe that for every investment on WRI and this accelerator, we can have a bigger impact in Brazil and the world. Thank you so much. And back to you, Mariana. Thank you, Fernando. You mentioned topics that I am sure Lady Mila and Elena will touch upon as well, talking about this decade of the ecosystem's restoration. This is our current situation and how can we contribute to this restoration ecosystem. One of the points that WRI has been doubling down on and debating with the partners ecosystem is the importance to plan, to train, the importance to provide technical assistance for the rural extension, to think about the financing and incentives for the farmers, thinking about research and development because everything must be backed up by, by science, and also thinking about how are you going to monitor these actions at property level, at community level. I believe it is important for us to think about all of these gaps that are yet to be bridged, actions that need to be strengthened to build opportunities. So that will help us to improve the incentives flow. And with that, I would like to say, hello, Helena, good afternoon. You have an extensive background with restoration, and um, you have a lot to teach. Different initiatives, whether public or private, sought to encourage the restoration chain and forestry businesses. I'd like to hear from you, Helena, the person who has been working in the public sector. What are the opportunities and difficulties of dealing with forestry businesses, which are key? to the sustainability of restoration. Good afternoon, Mariana and everyone. Thank you for this invitation. And again, congratulations on your accelerator initiative. I believe it's that's the type of action that will help the agenda move forward. First, I would like to tell you that I will go over time 
unless you cut me off, okay? Because I'll get really excited talking about it. So first, I truly believe in the feasibility of forestry projects for the production of timber and non-wood products at the Atlantic Forest. Throughout the years, we got used to not thinking about this possibility. The Atlantic Forest was meant to be preserved and period. And of course, part of it needs to be. So on the other hand, society would think, okay, the forestry is on our way. Let's just get rid of it so we can develop. Now we are thinking about the possibility of and Employing the forest for the production, but we forgot to put the native species at the core of that. So I believe in this opportunity, but we do have significant challenges to overcome. We are talking about innovative things. We know that exploring wood is um, as old as time, right? As old as our country, but producing wood products from native species, thinking about the usage of that wood is quite new. We don't have a lot of research around it. And I feel we have a, a lot to do for the treatment of these products, for new markets, it's a lot to be done. Since this is new, there is a significant share of risks and uncertainties that we need to mitigate in order to make the activity feasible. So we have to build a set of actions and policies to face the situation. I'm talking about, just as an aside, I'm talking about forestry for the production, because I believe this is an important component for the landscape restoration. Of course, we have the ecologic restoration that we need to pay attention to, but we can beyond that, beyond what's mandatory, beyond being compliant to the legislation. We have bigger opportunities. So what do we need? We need fin a financing that is compatible with such forestry businesses cash flow. We are talking about long-term businesses in Brazil. We are not used to such investments. We are not patient to wait for the return on our investments. And we think about our select rate. So we think that any money that will get into our cash flow, when we bring it to the present value, then it becomes nothing. But that's not how the world works. The world does think long-term, otherwise Nordic countries would not invest in it. The forestry is there, take 50, 60 years to grow, 100 years. Here we just have to wait for 30 years. So we must think about financing with interest rates, payment terms that are compatible to these forests. We have a long path ahead of us in terms of developing and improving technology, but we cannot wait for it. We need to start the landscape restoration in the short term. So simultaneously, we should be working with research, with development. We already have certain things going on, but we need more. Currently in Sao Paulo, we have the opportunity to work together with the synthesis and solutions based on nature. We call it the Biota Synthesis. It's financed by FAPESP. And uh, we need resources in order to nurture these projects. Let's think about Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus was introduced in Brazil by the end of last century, just for an ornamental purpose. And then it became a, um, it was part of uh, the rail track building. So there was a whole range of actions. Then we have the EPAF being created, an association of the 
the academia and the private sector, then we had incentives for the plantation of eucalyptus, and then in 60, 40 years, perhaps, eucalyptus is an important activity. It's important for our country and our state GDP. So maybe we should have a line of incentives for uh, the native species to give them a chance, just as Eucalyptus had. And this is a difficult situation because we understand that the public, public capital is the one with the greatest opportunity cost in the world because there are so many demands to be met with the same resource. So we need to fight for the money um, with our competition is housing, health, education, all of which need the resource. But if we are able to prove that the investment made in such forests will bring a return, a social return development, and also in the ecosystems, I believe we may be able to, to advocate that at this point, we need to assure public resources for such incentives. Mari talked about the Valley do Paraíba. Another important way to mitigate risks is the holes, the hubs mindset. So you will benefit the forest who will be working there, surrounding people. So you think about all of that as one enterprise with loads of players in the middle that works around that logic. So that helps mitigate risk. We need to pursue that. There are some interesting experiences starting in the state of Sao Paulo. We will follow them closely. Also, we need to convey information to people. The information needs to get to the people. We've developed an app with the support of WRI, and we are now implementing its um, second version. It will go live on the second term of this year. So it allows us to recommend to farmers in the countryside of Sao Paulo, wherever they are, the best mix of species for multifunctional forestry, thinking about maximizing the economic return, respecting all of the important ecosystem matters. So the landscape, the species, so at the end we will offer them a cash flow, recommending the different quantities of uh, seedlings for each species and the, how they should be distributed around their land in order to create a multifunctional project. So that's important together with all the effort that must be done in order to strengthen the restoration chain. As Fabiola said, it has a great potential to generate employment and income, but also we need to bring more resource to the region because it, should such employment be generated based exclusively on the farmers that are doing the mandatory implementations according to the legislation that will not be enough. So we need to bring the money, be it from carbon, be it from the selling of forestry products, we need to bring it to the regions that will make the difference. In our pilot at the Paraiba Valley, we thought about 10,000 hectares of multifunctional forestry to produce wood and native fruits to be implemented in 10 years. So a thousand hectares per year. I'm not good in remembering the numbers, but I think we were talking about 240 million reais in investment to implement such forests. This investment would lead to 1 billion, 1.5 billion reais in timber product, raw material, 800 million would come from outside to the region. So it would be probably revenue from the products sold outside the region with 200 million reais in taxes being collected. So you invest 200 million, you recover 200 million in taxes, you 
you make 800 million circulate in a rural region, so a high impact to the population, we have to make it happen. What's the first step? Well, I believe it is up to us, government, NGOs, companies. It's up to us to understand how important it is to kickstart it. Once it starts to move, then I'm sure it's going to, to flow and happen. So this is my provocation. Mari, Fabiola, Ludmila, Fernando, we are already on board, but we need a huge effort from everybody to really work on this blended finance logics, to, to convey some examples, to mitigate risks, the difficulty of uh, getting you know, the financing long-term, so it's a part of a non-reimbursable financing. Maybe we should provide incentives to the farmers. We should identify who who's going to buy the wood, the timber or the products. If we are able to do that, it's easier said than done. Of course, it's very difficult. The easier things have been accomplished already. Only the hardest ones are left. But if should we be able to do that, we will create inspiration and example for those who are interested in the topic. Please count on us because we count on you to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I also would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to send your questions because in a moment we will open a Q&A session with the panelists and I believe there is a lot to be asked, right? I'm really happy to see your participation. We have people from all, of, all over the state of Sao Paulo, Araraquara, people from uh, the the seaside, Bahia, Paraná State, Minas Gerais State. So, so happy to see all of you. Sometimes we think about the Atlantic forest as focused on, on the southeast of Brazil, but we also have the south, the northeast engaged. So we can see loads of different people interested in it. And Ludmila is the best person to tell us about the fact. Just two remarks on top of what Helena said. Not only r and is important, we've been working strongly on that at WRE. So we are thinking about a native subculture program. It's being debated in the coalition Brazil, climate, forests, and agriculture. It is very important to understand that we are not starting from scratch. Many people are working on it already. Helena tells us about driving complete packages, complete projects. It's important for us to understand all of the potentials, the potential that we are yet to tap on for future actions. Circling back to Lud Ludmila, so happy to have you. Your involvement, your engagement with the PACT goes back a few years. Some people here maybe don't know it so well. So I'd like to ask you to tell us about the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact and its most recent, the most recent acknowledgement recognition that the pact received from the UN. And also, considering that the theme of the panel is the forest business, can you tell us how the movement helps build local capacities to support large-scale restoration? Thank you, Mari. Thank you for the invitation. I'm currently the national coordinator, and I would like to say that Helena Carrascosa already did that. She's already been the national coordinator of the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact for two years. It's so important to 
engage government, businesses, NGOs, and to understand the restoration agenda. A while ago, we were debating the more technical and academic aspects, not that all of them uh, have been dealt with and done and dusted, but now we are talking also about risks. Helena just mentioned the financing, the risks, so it's interesting to understand how we are expanding our horizons beyond the technical matters that were prominent at the beginning of the pact. So the pact was created in 2009, a moment in which we didn't know very well where restoration was happening, what were the best methodologies. So a group of researchers, NGOs and companies came together in this movement that aims to restore 15 million hectares up to 2050. This pact is based on the representativeness of different sectors, the academia, government, NGOs, and companies. Currently, we have 300 members. And the governance of our movement is done via the representation of each sector. We have a board composed of the different sectors, and we have the national coordinator, me, Pedro Brancaleon, and Alex Mendes together, Pedro as a VP and Alex as uh, the executive secretary. And we have all of the stakeholders that help us to understand the bottlenecks for restoration, the strategies that we should promote. Pact is based on some premises. So one of them is the academia that we need to understand restoration scientifically. That's what initially brought all of these people together. But also to we are focused on increasing the scale and um, to have a proper governance. So we have different groups that work on different topics science and technology, that we have the gender work group, we have the communication work group, and one that deals specifically with um, assuring resources and financing for the movement. So all of these actions are performed by the work groups, and within the government, we have the regional units made of members that come to us to deal with um, the land issues, so particular problems, but they also take all of the movement agenda to the field with uh, all of its different points. So currently our main lines of action are the certified territories, Usually when we have, where we have regional communities that bring to us the restoration opportunities, building on what Helena said, they operate as a hub, not in terms of market, timber or wood derived products, but also a carbon market. So the idea is that we should be able to transform these territories in um, carbon generating sources. Another line of action is the monitoring of restoration, different monitorings from the actions in the field, but also thinking about satellite images, helping us to gain scale as well as social monitoring. So we have been developing a series of monitoring protocols to help us identify the scale gain, the quality of the restoration and its impact for the community. Lastly, we also act on communication and training that is very close to what we are talking about, the accelerator and the investment possibility. 
So it is precisely how can we make these regions and these members that we want to work with become empowered and trained. Even in restoration, many of us are highly technical in restoration, but we are not business savvy. We don't have that expertise to delve into the economic and capital financing matters. So the pact ran a study during the pandemic, so 2021, we tried to understand together with Sobre and the, the Alianza, we tried to raise, to understand all of the opportunities within the restoration chain. We have published a paper. You can find it on the PACT's website. Such research was done online with web forms and we have identified an employment generation for every 100 restored hectares. There is a possibility of generating 42 job positions. If we think about Plana Veg that aims to restore 2 million hectares, we are talking about 2.5 million hectares, right? 2 million, 2.5 million hectares. So this information is very, very relevant to us. When we consider such opportunities, both in terms of the restoration decade, as well as this restoration resuming. So one of the action lines of Plan of Ag was to finance restoration. So we have moved forward on the debate regarding what is restoration, but at the same time, we kind of, we are still talking about Plan of Ag already talked about. So my understanding is that perhaps after these three to four years, when we had different social political matters happening in the pandemic, I think we are able to resume the restoration plans. This is a new opportunity. Maybe we can even resume the Plan of Ag debate nationally. As Helena said, I believe that all of the governments are in their own ways bringing up possibilities. So this is a positive agenda and we must be able to foster it. PACT works with the training of the regional units. And usually what we have in terms of financing the financing for these regions are connected to NGOs. So the opportunity of working with SMBs is new to us. This is an opportunity that we weren't be able to touch upon yet. Now, we've already understood technically how restoration should be done. Talking about natural regeneration, and everything, but we could not make it happen. You know, that big leap, gain scale. It's about strategy, right? How can we bring that business view? Is that what will help, help us to gain the scale that we want to gain for the Atlantic forest? I think it's great that we have such initiatives because we understand, we understood from our study that the Atlantic forest does bring us opportunity because it is a uh, big region, which is expressively um, deforestated. So this is our opportunity to do it, right? We know we have some preserved areas and uh, we have been working on restoration, but we are yet to gain the momentum and the scale that we would like to. We know that Sao Paulo and the Atlantic Forest has great possibility of carrying out the restoration for many reasons. Many projects began in this region and they bring 
the understanding of how it is to work with restoration. Also, there are many colleges that um, promote the, the that academic training. So we have all of the opportunity. We have the knowledge. We have the lens. We have the resources. We have the policies. So indeed, they think it is about bringing it all together so we can gain scale. And lastly, Maria would like to talk about the decades flagship. Maybe flagship is not such a familiar term for everybody. You know, we, the first time we heard about an Abrolisi project as a flagship, um, someone said, please, can you translate that? So everybody was saying that. But um, so the project that has declared the Atlantic Forest as a flagship, as a beacon, was the Tri-National Alliance of the Pact that embraces many institutions from Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay that have submitted a proposal to UN, to UN proposing that UN, that the Atlantic forest should be seen as this, this big flagship for the financial back-end, for training, for education, communication and other actions that are important for us to scale up the restoration chain. Towards the end of last year, we were awarded that acknowledgement. More than 100 landscapes were competing and we were amongst the 10 chosen to be flagship landscapes and the Atlantic Forest with this particularity of engaging three countries. And uh, so together with the, the pact, with that, we have more possibility to create new jobs, new income, and this opportunity is more and more becoming a reality with the new opportunities, such as the accelerator. So. I'm so sorry, Mary, if I went over time. Well, you said a lot, but it was good. I think the goal here is precisely for us to share what is happening and also to start building these connections that have been nurtured for a while. From your talk, people in the chat are talking about farmers and how to support them. And I would like to underscore something that you said, WRI launched a study on the restoration governance together with the Sao Paulo University and the Unicamp University. We've mapped who is working with restoration and the farmer is always comes up as being central. I think that the private sector was also debated in this mapping, but I would like to invite you all to take a look at this uh, recently launched study. We have 15 more minutes to conclude our talk. We have some questions from the public. We have more than 250 participants. And again, I thank you all so much for your participation. So let me try and um, ask a few of the questions, feel free to answer together. Helena talked a little bit about multifunctional forests. Helena, one of the questions is how a multifunctional forest model takes into account the market for forestry projects and is it connected with the supply and demand model for such projects? For, su for such products, pardon. Another one. Well, everybody talks about investment, but people don't talk about the workforce. Even with technology, we know that at the end of the day, there's a lot of people backing it up. Maybe Fabiola could 
could comment on it. How can we work with this um, transition? Thinking about people, workforce, Ludi mentioned a article that was published recently. And the last question would be around the restoration productive chain. One of the examples is the seeds trade, native species seeds trade, and how can it connect different incentives? How are we seeing PSA today in the Atlantic forest? What are the incentive, the fomenting, foment lines? Maybe I can start, and um, because we have to speed up, I will um, give you two minutes, okay? Who would like to start? Let me start. You talked about the models, right? I believe they are talking about the model that will be recommended by our app. In order to build such models, we need a very, very extensive database with four million registries. Everything from management to the expected yield. Wood and non-wood products. We only put in our spreadsheet prices when we have an identified market for that product. And we put it together with the region because costs and prices are linked to that, to the region. And then, of course, the different environmental characteristics are linked to the different environment traits of that region. So when we talk about prices, we think about current prices in the market. Now you talked about the farmers. Yeah. I, they are the core of it. Everything that we are debating here will happen on someone's land, and only if that person wants it to happen. So we must create all of the conditions for people to be willing to do that. And I believe that when we associate, uh, be it uh, the ecologic restoration of uh, permanent preservation areas, or a multifunctional model, how to see that the property as a whole, we see we have room for opportunity in terms of productivity and environment performance. We have loads of degraded pastures that can produce the same amount of um, meat or milk in a smaller area with a more efficient way including and then uh, taking encompassing restoration different products. So what we need to do is we need to show that to the farmer in their time and in their language. This is our challenge. Thank you, Elena. Fabiola. Yes. Building on what Elena said, we are a far cry from the size of the need and its urgency. I do agree, agree Helena, that there is a huge potential for the forestry economy. But if we think about the, the, the type of capital backing that we need, we are so far from it. But we are a group of actors. So we are together the opportunity cost, it all entails investment. The cost opportunity is in favor of deforestation. I know it's hard for us to, to say that it doesn't make sense within our ideology, how we think, but for many people it does. And then carbon, the employment, and income, the connection of city and uh, and forest. This is these are all mid to long term policies. So the development of the workforce, the development of such economy, 
it is possible, but it needs to be structured. And Fernando, we also need an investment from the private sector in this global logic. We need a, a volume that is on par with the risk that we are facing as humankind. I know I bring you nothing new, but it's it's important to refresh that, right? We need to be creative and innovative in order to, to perform that leap, to really accelerate it, to gain momentum for the size of investment and policies. Even if they will take time, they need to be kickstarted immediately. So yes, we do have all of the pop proper conditions here, but yeah, we need to continue working I think Ludo was very nice that you mentioned Planavag because yes, we do have the possibility now to strengthen self, ourselves together with the federal government, right? So we should take advantage of that. I said I would be brief, but I was not. Okay, Fernando and Ludi, uh, I'll give you some space as well, but let me include some other elements. People are asking about carbon. And, you know, it's the hot topic. So, Fernando, can you perhaps share with us how the private sector sees carbon restoration, this link? How does Salesforce sees it? And, Lute, we have a question here about how do we think entrepreneurship and the drive for evidence-based practices taken into account decades of researches around restoration in order to look forward to the future. Can you please comment on that? Okay, may I? Thank you, Mari. Well, thinking about what Helena said, well, I'm biased, right? Because I used to work for the government before coming to the private sector. So I am in awe with the magnitude and how long lasting the public investments can be. So we can have a regulation that can open for more investments from the private sector. Because today, we have to think, how can a company invest, for example, in carbon, as you said, Mary, if we have no carbon market regulated yet, we don't know what's the best carbon, carbon credit. The state should be able to shape the market to revert this uh, perverse logic around the land opportunity costs that Fabiola mentioned. So if you are in, if we have a structure to invest in carbon, then we will have a higher return from degraded areas in a shorter term. Now, Brazil aims to be a beacon on the global carbon market. So how can it disrupt the market instead of just acting on its gap? companies want to understand how are you going to invest with more quality, more impact, more biodiversity, and also if you are remunerating that somehow, then the, the, the social benefits. So how can you benefit the native population, the surrounding communities? Then Helena talked about, so how is Salesforce talking about doing it in technical aspects? So we have that net zero cloud and that helps us, helps any institution to monitor the carbon footprint within the scopes one, two and three. And then you have all of the tips to become net zero emission in a midterm. And we also have a community of environment entrepreneurs that make their carbon credits available through 
world biomes to companies, organizations, and governments that once they are inside the cloud, they can already purchase their credits there and it's fully auditable. So it's just a facilitator, this cloud. So, and also Salesforce had other projects on the pipeline with uh, rear generators. Yes, I can see we have some IS colleagues here. So uh, the legitimacy and sustainability on the long term for the Brazilian carbon market can be a huge economic and social opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Lud, let me give the floor to you. And there is one question that I think we can include, which is how do you see the academia? We know that within the pact, we have many universities. So what is the academia role in this attempt of expanding the forestry restoration actions? We often said, that there's a lot of knowledge around it already. So what else do we need moving forward? Excellent. I think this question gives us uh, the, the, the drive that we needed. So of course, restoration has a strong scientific foundation. The pact, as I've told you, was first created by researchers, so experts in the matter. And we needed that in order to understand how should we do restoration. Now, minimally, we know how to do it. We know that there are other knowledge gaps, uh, but special for, for, Mara, for the Atlantic forest, we have a lot of knowledge. So all of this knowledge the technicians have, and I understand that some landowners also understand already about restoration because the restoration entails understanding the natural vegetation so we are allowing nature to do its work it's so we are going beyond the academia walls to have greater community participation but one of the gaps that we still have is precisely what we are debating here today. Financing, carbon, how does it work? How can you bring this uh, business point of view to the restoration actions as well? So I do believe that we need to go beyond the ecology and restoration per se in order to make our actions more, to make them broader from the business point of view and also from the social impact point of view. Currently, we are talking about the safeguards. We didn't used to talk about it before, but now it's really important in terms of carbon as well. So we need that, you know, projects that take into account the business point of view, the social impact, how can we mitigate social risks that we are facing and that is closely closely linked to the investments. So in my opinion, that's the way forward. So we can shape our restoration actions and bring more and more knowledge. So the pact actions in these last 14 years, even, you know, this is so crazy because before the pandemic, I used to say four, 12 years, and now it's like, it's weird that it's 14 because I didn't see these two years happening, but yeah, 14, almost 15 years, a lot of knowledge that generated at the very beginning, technical knowledge, but now I do believe um, this is what is important, how to encompass all of these different matters and how can we support other biomes as well. I do believe that we have great capacity to support actions at the Atlantic forest, at the Amazon, at uh, the Cerrado, and um, I, lo I see loads of monitoring projects, guys, but we really need to keep them up because I can count on the fingers of one hand the ones that are still going on, so maybe we can better prioritize things in order to convince the market that the actions are effective. Thank you, Mari. 
Guys, I would like to now give you one or two minutes for your final remarks. We have so, so many questions arriving and it is always a challenge to be moderating and typing and everything. I will be talking about the accelerator in a moment for those who are asking about the accelerator. We'll be talking about that in a minute. So for those who want to engage in restoration, what's the first step? Those that are already working in some type of R&D project, native species project, what's the perspective for these people? And lastly, the fintech's point of view. And what is the fintech's role to contribute with the restoration agenda? So we would like to get your mixed feelings and final remarks. Okay, I will try to start. I'm sorry it's so much. We won't be able to answer all of the questions, but this perspective that we need to, to put in our DNA, the social and economic aspects of the projects, that's not new, but not only will it open up the possibility of scaling up to bring the scale opportunity, the scale perspective, which is fundamental, but also as players within the economic matters, we can bring the environment integrality to this table. I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear. The thing is, the carbon uh, economic wise, of course, as an economic project, it is harmful, of course, it's very harmful. But if it is linked to a logic of land usage that delivers some exploration, but also the ecosystem balance that we need, then it's wonderful. So we need to be sitting at the table when people are discussing the carbon market. So please count on us, WRI, but not only us, many partners as well. And uh, we will have other projects coming along that will be able to, to boost these um, intelligence and then we have the accelerator it's just a small piece mary will be sharing about it with you guys but it's, it's you know so we need to go to the world to reach out to the public and private actors that um, that have the capital and with that enhance uh, the environment social strength that's what moves us right so we need to, to put our toe in the economic matters. I think it should be Fernando, but now I've opened my mic already and he's a gentleman, I'm a grandma, I'm sure he will give me priority. Guys, I just want to reinforce, to underscore something yet again. We talk about FinTech Accelerator that lead us to things that lead us to think about the urgency of it. But on the other hand, we have this humongous challenge, which is to convince landowners. They have their own logic, they have their own time, different than ours. I recall Professor Kardeyama, he used to say that in order to do something, the person needs to know, to want to do that and to be able to do that. So we need to convey the information. We need to charm that person so that the person wishes to do that. And also we want, we need to make it possible, offering the proper conditions. And I'm not pushing aside command and control and surveillance. I'm just saying that the mandatory restoration is not enough. So we need, we've been debating restoration for many, many years. First was, was just the, the riverbed, forestry, etc. But then we think about that core actor, which is missing from the table. So we need to think about that. 
and we need to be more effective in that regard. This, this is my final message to all of you. This is this biggest challenge. If today I had a truckload of money to 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 farmers to foment the forest anywhere, we would be stuck for some time until we can have a farmer buying in. We see it in every state. Maybe we are lacking tools to better understand their times, their reasoning. That's it, guys. Let's keep on moving. Thank you, Helena. So quickly, Fernando and Ludi. Thank you, Helena, Mari. So I think the current mission of Salesforce that we try to convey is companies do try to find your way towards net zero emissions. That's the bare minimum that you should be thinking about in your productive activities, but also how to do that the best possible way. Have, you must have a climate action plan that is coherent, that is validated, auditable, and et cetera, et cetera. Inform yourselves, join forces with other companies. Governments, please open mechanisms for the private sector to participate in financing as well as in the technological support. We can do many things together. And mainly, they should bring the leg 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 legitimacy that only the government can convey when you have an investor for the better future of our state, country, and cities. And third sector, do not count only on us for financing, but also work, labor work for us, more training. It is in our best interest that we should have a qualified, trained third sector as WRI, WRI is doing, so we need to better train ourselves. Thank you. Lute? Well, Mary, you asked what could I say for people who want to start working with restoration. In our website, the PACT website, we have all of the knowledge amassed in the last 14 years. There is the PACTO challenge study, for example, in which we tried to understand natural regeneration and how can it be strengthened with the landowners. So why it is um, set, hindered, perhaps, or cut short. So all the restoration was the first axis of Planavag, awareness of landowners. That was the first thing. And again, I say that we could not move forward on that just as financing. So we are rev revisiting that. So these are important, you know awareness, financing. And lastly, Elena, I think you bring something that is important. It can be the painful way, but it's much better if it is the friendly way. So, you know, if we can put that cherry on the top and we can charm them, you know, that's much better. How can we bring that to restoration and to our actions? Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you, everyone. Again, I would like to thank you guys for accepting the, the, the invitation. I would like to thank all of you who sent questions. I know that we could not answer all of them but it's about opening the space for this exchange of knowledge. Thank you all so much. Now we'll move on to the presentation, the introduction of our accelerator. We have 10 more minutes. So at the end of my talk, I will bring you the answer to some of your questions. And let me tell you, some of you sent questions via email. We did not forget about you. We will build a FAQ section because many are frequent questions. But um, 
Today, I will be able to answer your questions regarding the accelerator. So let me share my screen. OK, so our forestry business accelerator was launched last year during the Brazilian conference of ecologic restoration that happened at Espirito Santo State. We took advantage of that moment to bring awareness to this program that is a program for the, for training and attracting resources to entrepreneurs that work with restoration, reforestation and agroforestry around the Atlantic forest. Okay, but what is that, Mariana? What is this accelerator? Well, well our program has two phases. On the first phase, we will select 20 business that will be part of a personalized program with face-to-face -face meetings, virtual training sessions, a virtual platform for collaboration, and a space for the entrepreneur to present their business to peers and external partners. On the second phase, the accelerator will choose five of these businesses and they will receive a closer look from our partners. We will visit each one of the five businesses. They will also receive a capital injection of up to 50,000 reais, and they will have virtual follow-up sessions. Mariana, how can I be part of this process? Well, the registration opened on the 30th of November last year, and that will conclude on the 27th of February. We have the webinar today on the 30th of January. And besides this webinar, we will also have an extra session. We are, we named it the Q&A session because the registration tool is in English. So we want to support those that don't understand the English language and um, so they can register themselves because the program will be developed in Portuguese, only the platform that we could not translate right now. Also, we've been preparing a support material with the step-by-step. -step. How should we access the F6S platform? So once we conclude registrations in February, we will choose, we will shortlist these 20 businesses for the May and June accelerator program. And then in June, we will choose five for the financial backend. And then we will have the tailored mentorship from June to October. Now, we already have our on our website the public note, the public call notice with all of the information that you need, all of the businesses that can apply, a little bit of uh, the times and hours. That's important, right? Once you apply, you are committing yourself to being part of the program. For the first part, we will have 60 hours, and then for the second phase, 40 hours. So it is 100 hours of dedication to strengthen these business that will be selected by the accelerator. Eligibility. Mariana, is my business eligible? Well, first, the business, the company must be operating on the Atlantic forest. So we are focusing on the Atlantic forest at this moment. So small and medium businesses, SMBs, associations, or cooperatives can apply as long as they have profit ends, for profit ends. Oh, Mariana, I am a non-for-profit entity, but I have an economic end. 
oh can i can i apply yes you can so what are the type of businesses that you guys are interested in everything from uh, seeds production from commercializing seedlings or products from the restored areas such as timber fruits food and also related services services related to restoration such as technical assistance engagement and education so companies cooperatives that work with the treatment of wood and non-wood products pulps beverages in general the processing of fruits technical assistance and the rural extension extension for farmers monitoring restoration reforestation with native species nurseries and a collection of seeds implementation and management of agroforestry these guys are examples of business that can apply okay this is not an exhaustive list if you are engaged with this restoration chain and you are eligible you can apply we are not contemplating ngo and non-for-profit business at this moment because the accelerator is focusing on a sector that is fomenting actions that may generate income from degraded areas so the accelerator logic at this point is to foment the business chain okay so we are trying to encompass the diversity of actors that we have and to bring them closer as i've told you you can submit your application directly on the platform that again is named f6s it is available on the wri brazil website and you can apply up to the 27th of February, midnight Brazilian time, which is GMT minus three. We know that the platform is only in English, but from the moment that you enroll on a platform, all of the FAQ will be, the questions will be in portuguese and you can um, answer in portuguese as well we apologize for the language barrier we want to make sure that it does not affect those that wish to to apply those that have read our public call notice and that are interested if you want more support please come to our support section on the 16th of February, 5 p.m. But at the end of the day, so everybody will be able to, will have better chances to participate. And you can already enroll for this section we will answer all of your questions around eligibility and how to understand the platform those who have sent us emails please keep communicating we are trying to answer all of your questions to sort all of your doubts and also please promote it on your your platforms because we know that there are many people who are working with forestry businesses atlantic forest and that could be part of our call thank you so much we are so short on time i just want to thank you all again for your presence topics that will be selected for the program are still being decided because we want to take into account the business needs what the companies are sharing with us to be their needs so we can encompass that on the website on the public call notice we have a lot more information about the two phases and we'll get into further detail from now on i want to apologize 
for rushing about, for speeding up and not having time to answer all of the questions. Your participation is fundamental. Once again, I invite you to be part of our Q&A session, our support session, and I invite you to send us emails with your questions. The WRI team is here for you. We want to interact, we want to help you to complete your application. Thank you for your participation. I would like to thank all of the panelists, the WRI team, the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact, the Sigma's interpreters team who has helped us connect with our foreign friends. And that's it. Thank you all so much. It is such a great pleasure to be here with you. I hope it's been productive. I invite you again to access the WRI content, our partners' contents as well. We've been working strongly in our social media platforms to, to raise awareness. We believe that the Accelerator is a great opportunity to look at these SNBs who are in the restoration business. Thank you so much. I wish you all a great afternoon.